Welcome again to Aerodynamics. So, um, uh, we are talking about the origins of the aerodynamic uh, force, and um, these are some of the dimensionless numbers that, or the, the dimensionless numbers that we are mostly interested in. So, we would like to look to look at the uh, pressure coefficient because we are going to talk next about the uh, pressure. So, I'd like you to pay attention to the static pressure as opposed to the um, um, environmental pressure far away from the object, or which we call T-infinity, or our reference pressure. Um, so this, the static pressure um, is an important quantity that is involved in the lift and the drag uh, generation. And it's compressed, and as we've said before, it's a compressive and perpendicular quantity. And the way that you would measure the static pressure over the surface of an object, uh, such as uh, a wing, uh, you would have um, uh, static pressure ports, uh, little tiny holes with tubes going through the wing into a pressure transducer. So that distributed, pr that distributed pressure is going to um, to contribute, as we said, to the uh, to the f to the uh, drag and uh, lift forces. So how do we deal? So if now let's assume that I have the shape of the wing and I have the pressure distribution. How do I? Um, what are the important quantities that I need to look for? Uh, so we we go back to our distributed pressure force on general surfaces. So consider this uh, surface here. Um, uh, it has a surface area A, and it has a pressure distribution on this um, on the uh, that acts on it, P of x and y, with this x and y being our coordinate system. Um, so we know that the pressure acts compressive and perpendicular. So for any area dA of length dL and width in B into the page, there is a force F due to the pressure, which is just the uh, pressure times the area, and it's compressive and uh, perpendicular. So that's the basic premise of the pressure force. And now if I want that um, elemental pressure force on this elemental area dA, has two orthogonal components, dfx and dfy, and now if I want the net force, so one quantity that we would be interested in, what is the net force over uh, this uh, surface area A? Um, and this surface area A uh, is a general surface, but for us we are thinking about aerofoils and aerodynamic shapes that um, we are, that have a pressure distribution over them and we are interested in finding the force. So the first thing is to, is to do, if I want the net force over the whole surface, I need to do uh, a vectorial summation or more easily an algebraic summation by uh, decomposing or projecting the df onto the x and y axes and then summing all the x for uh, the forces in the x direction. So that's what we're doing uh, over here. And the projection involves a sine and a cosine theta for the x and y components. Uh, so the net force is just the uh, sum squared, right? Uh, that's what we uh, were familiar with. And the inclination angle for the net force with the x-axis is just the um, uh, tangent uh, of, the, of the ratio of the forces. And then the last piece of information we want to, to, to know is, or to learn how to compute, if this is my origin, I and this is my uh, elemental area, and that's my elemental force df, I need to understand how much moment this elemental force is contributing um, around point O. So that's the moment around point O would be the perpendicular distance to the point um, multiplied by the force. Uh, and we could either do it with F, or we can just uh, take the two orthogonal components. The moment will be the moment due to the Fy, right? Multiplied by the x distance, which is what we have here. Or plus the dfx multiplied by the vertical distance, which is the y. So that's what you have here. 
and you'll see in this in this picture uh, the Fy is contribute around 0 0.0 so here we're doing the moment around 0 0.0 the Fy is contributing with a clockwise moment uh, around 0, 0.0 as you can see uh, while um, the Fx is contributing a counterclockwise moment that's why we have the minus sign so they're um, they act the moments act uh, against each other so if, if you want to uh, to uh, a refresher on why we have cosine and sine theta and um, then you can just go back to the triangle this DL um, is inclined at an angle theta so it projects into x and y dx and dy and if you're interested also in Cartesian so that's more like the revision so you can look at you can pause here and, and look at it um, but the main point from all this is that the force F due to pressure acts compressive and perpendicular on the surface at uh, on that on that area DA so now we found the net force and we found that the moment we found the moment that it contributes the moment um, due to the due to the pressure distribution over the surface around uh, point O. So we, we have a force and we have a moment and now um, we can define a point where we we can define a point where this force has uh, zero moment, where the net force will have zero moment. So there is a there is such a point on this surface where the moment due to the hydrostatic pressure force about it. So let's say I'm going to pick maybe somewhere midway. Um, the left part of the area is going to contribute sort of a uh, counterclockwise moment while the right part is going to contribute a clockwise moment and right at this particular point it's just I made that up um, the net moment due so this M about this particular point now I'm going to call it CP is actually going to be equal to zero that CP is called the center of pressure so the hydrostatic pressure for the the um, the aerodynamic for pressure force is going to be to be equal to uh, zero. The aerodynamic uh, pressure force, the moment due to that force, is going to be zero around this center of pressure. Um, so by definition, uh, the, uh, the moment around the center of pressure is zero. So let's say I know my force. I found it from the previous example. I found the force. Uh, due to the pressure and I found the moment around point O and an arbitrary point O so if I have those two I can tell where my center of pressure is um, so I don't really need to look for it I will just find the moment around any point find the net force divide the two and that will give me the perpendicular distance L perpendicular between point O and the action line um, of F net uh, through the center of pressure. So um, that L perpendicular is the distance from point O to the center of pressure. Right, so and perpendicular and perpendicular to F net. So distance from point O to center of pressure. Um, in fact, it's the, the perpendicular distance from point O uh, to the force F. Uh, to the action line of force F um, and the force F goes through the center of pressure so that's what it is so let's go to we'll, we'll talk about this um, a little bit in the next example so to find this perpendicular distance you find the moment around O any arbitrary point divide by the net force due to pressure and you'll get it so the, um, here here is uh, a simple example this is my area A it's flat and I have a uniform pressure P, so the net force is the net force due to this pressure distribution is P times A. And now um, that F net I can place it anywhere I like on on this surface. Um, I can have it act at the midway 
and it's going to produce a zero moment. And by definition, because it produces a zero, point, a zero moment around the midpoint, that midpoint is my center of pressure because there is no moment by the, by the hydrostatic pressure flow. Uh, the reason, as you see, at this midpoint, the moment due to this part of the pressure force is counterclockwise, while due to this part of the pressure force, it's clockwise. And because of symmetry left, right, uh, in pressure and in area, we're going to get a zero uh, net moment. But, so this picture, number one, is the same, this picture is the same as this picture. Um, and it's the same as um, the picture that I've just drawn, drawn below. So that's equivalent. So I have a distributed pressure force over the area A. Uh, that would be equivalent. So I found the F net. It would, that's exactly equivalent to uh, putting the force on the edge of the beam at point A, the force due to this distributed pressure P uh, at point A. And now the question is, how do you find the magnitude of the moment that is associated with, with the force? So the moment comes from the perpendicular distance between the center of pressure and the action point A, so that's LA. So, um, so when you go right, so when you move the force rightward, you you add up the um, you add up the moment. So this is the moment at the center of pressure. It's zero plus the F net. Now let's say uh, I would like to put the force F net on the on point B, which is at uh, at the left uh, leftmost side of the um, of the beam. Uh, then. Um, I need to associate with it, add to it a moment uh, that's um, uh, that's um, that would make it equivalent to the picture on on the top. So the picture on the top, all these four pictures, one, two, three, four, are equivalent, uh, and it's about the translation of of the force. When you translate a force, a distance, a perpendicular distance L, you need to transfer a moment with it. And that's what we're doing here. For us, why do we do this? For us to, to maintain the, um, the equivalum, uh, equilibrium or the equivalency, because we're, we're talking about equivalency. Uh, it's harder, uh, it's more complex to work with a distributed pressure. It's easier to work with a point, pr with a point force uh, and just a moment. So that's what that's what we're doing here. And if I now want to, to go from uh, to transfer the force uh, F from one edge to the other, uh, it'll be F net. So going to the left, I subtract. So um, so I have uh, I subtract the the moment associated with it. So the F net, I'll put it on the left. And now the moment will be the moment at point A minus the moment associated with, with all this length LA plus LB. The moment at point um, uh, A is F net times LA. And here I subtract from it F net times LA plus LB. So LA with LA goes away and I end up with F net times LB. Um, so yeah, you move you move the force to the right, you add up, and then if you move to the left, you uh, you subtract. So that's the same story. I mean, you can look at this example and uh, all these. Uh, I can so here's a wing, and I have a distributed pressure force, um, and distributed pressure, and let's say I'm talking about my lift force. I can place my lift force anywhere I like on the wing, but that has an implication. What does it mean to place the lift force on the wing? So this is my wing, and now I decide to to weld it to um, or pin it uh, to the fuselage of of um, of the aircraft. So I can so let's say here we're talking about pinning. Uh, I can pin it near at the leading edge. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll run the pin through the leading edge and into the fuselage, but that's going to that's going to be associated with a moment m at the leading edge. 
uh, I can pin it at the quarter chord or I can pin it at the center of pressure. This would be the best point to pin it because I wouldn't have a moment, so because the mo by definition the center of pressure has no moment about it due to the pressure distribution, um, then, uh, then once I set my, my airfoil, um, I pin it to the, to the body, to the fuselage, to the side of the wind tunnel, uh, it's not going to have any significant um, moment due to the hydrostatic pressure force, so I can control it much easily. While here it would have some, uh, some biased moment that I have to counteract with some other force or some other fo uh, moment. And this is how you translate the force from point A to point B to point C. You add the moment to it uh, according to this, um, according to what we just um, covered in the previous slide. Uh, and here is, um, if you want to refresh on the hydrostatic pressure force um, on an inclined flat surface, uh, you can find the center of pressure um, over this surface. So here is your uh, top view, and here is your side view. You see it's a flat surface. So that's the area, that's the surface of area A. Uh, you, you, can evaluate the net hydrostatic pressure force as well as its action point at the center of pressure. The location of the center of pressure, YCP and XCP, measured relative to the center of gravity. So the origin in our system here is X and Y are located at the center of this area marked in, in pink. Uh, but this whole slide is to tell you what the, where the center of pressure is located. And maybe one, one more thing to say is due to the, if you look at the pressure distribution here, you, you'll notice that it's trapezoidal, and which means that the uh, pressure at the bottom is higher than the pressure at the top, uh, the, uh, the uh, reduced depth. So you're going to get a bias um, of the pressure from the bottom. So the net for the center of pressure is going to be biased towards the uh, the deeper location, then uh, it wouldn't be at the midpoint, it'll be closer uh, biased towards the um, a deeper depth. Okay, so um, we are talking about the the um, how to compute the net force due to a distributed due to a distributed pressure over an object, as well as where the action point of that uh, distributed pressure force should be, for that net force due to the distributed pressure should be, um, as well as the moment associated with it. And we have now uh, defined the, the, location, the center of pressure as the point due to this pressure distribution where you have zero moment. So um, this is something we will we will be coming back to uh, in more detail later on. So if you look at so here we have two types of uh, of pressure distribution that same that same airfoil. So you see this is my this is the airfoil I'm looking at for the bottom part. So one one observation is that. Um, the the line the thick line signifies the magnitude of the pressure so the distance between uh, the airfoil and the line signifies the magnitude of the pressure and the pressure force acts perpendicular and compressive so the pressure force really comes from the direction at, come comes from the shape of the airfoil the geometry the magnitude comes from the distribution. So this is what this picture is about. And one additional point I would like to make on this picture is that at the bottom surface, the pressure distribution um, is the red line. However, you'll see that on the top surface, I have a green and yellow line. Uh, and each one is associated with a different interaction between the shear forces, that's the viscous shear stress, and between the 
uh, pressure distribution that is the pressure gradient so in one case um, which is um, the green case my uh, my pressure is it my uh, flow is attached so that means uh, the shear stress um, yeah the um, the the adverse pressure gradient does not disturb the boundary layer and disturb the pressure the, the shear stress in a significant way so the flow remains attached and that's associated with a large uh, lift generation however for that same flow let's say you take a hammer and hit the wing uh, you can create a disturbance, but that disturbance is going to um, to get amplified, and now the effect of the adverse pressure gradient, that is the pressure distribution over the surface of the of the aerofoil, uh, is now going to um, significantly interact with the shear stress and cause the, the boundary layer to separate and. When you have a separated boundary layer, you're going to get the yellow pressure distribution. So it's a two-way coupling, and that is going to induce a lower uh, lift associated with it. So this picture comes to explain two things. One is the uh, pressure distribution. Once you have it, you can compute the net force, and you can compute the location of the center of pressure. That's point one. Point two is that this in this picture, uh, we see the effect of the pressure distribution um, that is the adverse uh, zero pressure gradient or favorable uh, pressure gradient interaction with the shear stress. So this picture explain you know demonstrates those two those two important points uh, that we just uh, mentioned. So this will be coming back. Uh, later on okay so in our revision of, of uh, fluid mechanics um, we want um, to revise the the Peter tube and remember in a previous lecture we were talking about the ground speed and we were talking about the atmospheric speed and then we were talking about the speed um, seen by an observer sitting on the airplane uh, the speed of the wing seen uh, the speed of the wind seen by an observer sitting uh, on the airplane and that is our aerodynamic force that that's um, associated with the force generation and with the mass fluxes and momentum fluxes and that's what generates the aerodynamic forces um, so it's our u infinity um, which we have all we have, which we have referred to as the relative velocity uh, early in the course. Um, it's not the ground speed, it's not the atmospheric wind speed, but it's a combination of both. It's the relative of the vectorial relative effect of both of them. So that's the um, speed of the wind as seen by someone sitting. Uh, on the airplane and that someone is, is the Peter tube so the Peter tube is a device uh, so here is the belly of an of an airplane towards the front um, you'll see there is a Peter tube here and there is um, a Peter tube over there uh, and here they say it's a standby Peter tube but if you zoom on it what it is it's um, an L-shaped pipe uh, that has a hole at the front it has a hole at the front and it would all that's called the stagnation pressure port and it has a hole uh, at the side uh, on the surface uh, which is called the the, um, the static pressure port so let's see how the, how this works so we have seen this before in our introductory fluid mechanics course but let's uh, go over it really quickly so the Peter tube is a device that actually allows us to measure the u infinity the relative speed that's the that important probably the most important quantity uh, to have 
uh, when you're flying an, uh, an aircraft because everything else depends on it. So this is, that's why you have uh, more than one pewter tube and you have even a standby uh, because it's so critical for, for the mission of, um, of flying. So here is the pewter tube and um, what you see is uh, far away from the pewter tube and far away from the airplane. Um, that is, what do we mean by far away? You see, once you get closer to the airplane, the, the air will, cannot go through the airplane, so it has to deflect. So, and that effect of deflection can be felt up to a few meters um, upstream of the airplane. So it can be felt here and here and here. So if you go a sufficient distance upstream into the wind, um, you wouldn't, the effect of the disturbance of the airplane, so here, let me explain what, what I mean. So here you have, um, let me just draw here, I will erase it. Here's your airplane, it's moving in this direction. It would have some circle of influence um, where the air particles will start, deflect, will start deflecting at that location of circle of influence. So if I'm sufficiently far away from this circle of influence, so let's say here, the airstream comes in uh, undisturbed. It doesn't feel the effect of the aircraft. So here, that's what we. That's why we draw parallel velocity vectors um, in at infinity. So that's a that's uh, a distance sufficiently far away from the aircraft. It could be one length, 10 lengths, maybe 10, air, 10 diameters or 10 length scales associated with, um, uh, with the aircraft. So, um, so that's when, what we mean by U infinity and P infinity. So at, at the location, at far away from the airplane, um, the the uh, someone sitting on the airplane sees that the wind is coming at velocity u infinity, um, and the pressure to be the undisturbed pressure at the infinity. So that's point infinity. And now take us. And now the wind is going to come towards the pewter tube. Some of it is going to deflect around it, uh, and some uh, to the top, some to the bottom, some to the right, some to the left. But the um, fluid particle that's right at the center, right at the opening of the pewter tube, is actually going to go in a straight line and going to hit the front of, the, of this uh, opening. Um, so now I have a streamline between infinity and this port of the pewter tube. So you see the wind has nowhere to go uh, inside. So now I'm looking inside. So that arrow to signifies inside the pewter tube. So here it stagnates, it completely stops. So the velocity of the wind, let me just draw it for you. Uh, it starts with U infinity here. So here I'm plotting with X. So X is the horizontal axis. I'm plotting the uh, U. So I start with U infinity. So here, at this location x, at infinity, u is u infinity. But as I get closer and closer to, to the pewter tube, my velocity is going to decrease, decrease, decrease until I get to zero. Uh, so I'm plotting the velocity of an air particle as it moves closer and closer to the uh, port of the pewter tube. So it, it comes to complete stagnation. So it com comes to a complete stop. And on the Peter tube, there is another port which actually measures the P infinity, the static pressure, uh, which is pro which is very close. It measures the static pressure, and that is very close to the P infinity, to the undisturbed pressure. Here, there is some disturbance, but we're going to assume uh, that that's P infinity. Um, so somehow it, we sort of measure this. So now I can on this. So now I have a streamline between point infinity and point s. The stagnation, by definition, the stagnation. 
the stagnation point uh, has zero velocity, that's the fluid particle. And I can do Bernoulli between th those two points. So P plus half rho u square is P plus half rho u square, but the, zero, the stagnation velocity is zero. So that's at infinity, and that's the P stagnation. Uh, so I measure the P stagnation with this hole, and I measure the P infinity, or approximately the P infinity with this hole, and I then subtract them and divide by the density multiplied by two, and that would give me the velocity of, um, of the air. So that's how a Peter tube works. Um, and believe it or not, with all the GPS um, technology that we have nowadays, uh, still we can't get rid of this, this simple Peter tube to measure the incoming uh, wind velocity. GPS wouldn't cut it. It actually would be very dangerous to do that because of the possibility of a tailwind or a headwind, as we have uh, discussed in a previous lecture. Okay, so one question is, um, so let's let's test this uh, this equation and see how much of a stagnation pressure should we expect if we are cruising at a cruising altitude and a cruising speed. There is a square over here. Um, so let's see. So let's say we're cruising at a thousand me ten thousand meters at nine hundred kilometers per hour, uh, and we want to know what what this P stagnation, what should we expect? Should it be uh, in millipascal, pascals, kilopascals, megapascals? So that's what the question is. So we can go to, we can go to the atmospheric um, data uh, in Appendix D at 10,000 kilometers. We can get the density, temperature, and everything. So we get the density, and we also get the, the atmospheric pressure. And then you can also get the, the temperature if you need it. We don't need it at this point. Um, and the problem tells us we're moving at 900 kilometers per hour. So we're moving at, uh, divide by 3.6. That gives you the meters per second. That's the cruising speed, 250. Um, and then on that streamline, the relationship between the stagnation pressure and the measured quantities uh, or the speed uh, is so. So we'll substitute for P infinity with this 26.1 kilopascal. Uh, the density is here and the U infinity, we, are, we have it there. So we end up with um, 30, 38.9 uh, kilopascal. There is the atmospheric pressure component and there is the dynamic head component. Both of them give us the stagnation pressure. So that's what the stagnation pressure reads. And if I convert this to, to centimeters of H2O, the atmospheric pressure at that altitude is around two and a half meters and the dynamic head is around 1.3 uh, meters of column of water. Um, so I get around four meter uh, column of water, that is four meter. That would be my PS, my stagnation pressure. So my stagnation pressure is around four meters. My dynamic head is around 1.3 uh, meters. The last piece of information uh, we want to cover um, in uh, chapter one in Anderson's book is the uh, in our revision of fluid mechanics is the Navier-Stokes equation. So the Navier-Stokes equation is just the another manifestation of Newton's second law, uh, force equals mass times acceleration. Um, so if you see here, you have velocity over time, so that's what we call the local acceleration. And here you have a velocity multiplied by velocity multiplied divided by distance and that also gives you um, an acceleration so that we call the local acceleration that the uh, convective acceleration all this is just what we call the total acceleration of the fluid so what this navier stokes equation describes is the newton second law for um, an elemental control volume 
uh, or fluid element that is uh, infinitesimally small uh, in size. So on one side we have the acceleration on, and on the other side we have the, um, uh, the forces per unit mass. So we have the gravity force, we have the pressure gradient force, and lastly you see here we have viscosity, so we have the shear stress uh, force. So you see now this should ring a bell. We see the pressure force that we have been talking about and we see the shear stress uh, that we have also been talking about. Gravity is typically in most aerodynam in aerodynamic cases is not important and that's why in the previous lectures we were talking about the pressure as well as the shear stress uh, or the viscous uh, shear stress, um, wall shear stress. Um, because they, because we were talking about the aerodynamic force generation and um, the aerodynamic uh, force generation uh, relies heavily um, in its assessment on our pressure distribution and our shear stress uh, distribution. So once we have the aerodynamic uh, forces, then we can get the accelerations uh, of the fluid. So that's that's in a, in a nutshell what the Navier-Stokes equation sort of tells you. It has so much more to tell, but um, we can just stick with F equal times, uh, F equal M times A. And then the other important uh, component of the Navier-Stokes equation is continuity or mass conservation. So mass is not destroyed and mass is not created. So it, it takes this shape for a constant density incompressible flow. Um, so, this takes us, um, this takes us to, um, to the end of, uh, chapter one, and we can actually, um, keep going, uh, with just the first part of, uh, chapter two in, in Anderson's book, and we're only covering a very short portion of it um, and we will come to it uh, in a sec. So the first thing we want to talk about is streamlines. Uh, so you look at, at this aerofoil uh, down here. Uh, you look at this aerofoil down here. The streamline, and you're familiar with it now, it's, it's a line that sort of describes the direction of the of the airflow around the around the um, aerofoil or around the object that we have and we we actually just a minute ago we talked about the streamline when we were discussing um, when we were discussing the um, the um, Peter tube and uh, how to apply Bernoulli so because Bernoulli applies over a streamline so the concept of a streamline again so now you you start thinking okay we have pressure is important, as we have just have seen in the Navier-Stokes equation, and streamlines are related to Bernoulli from our fluid mechanics course, and Bernoulli gives us pressure, so my, it, it is an important point to talk about uh, streamlines. So streamlines and pressure are related, uh, there is a connection in, in there through the Bernoulli equation, um, and um, one property of the streamline is that it, des it describes the direction of the flow. But by definition, a streamline is just a line. Um, so it's a line, a curvilinear line. It's curved or it's straight. Um, and at, so here are, here are multiple streamlines. That's the same aerofoil. So we'll take one of those streamlines. Uh, at any point on the streamline, the tangent, so it's this black line right here, at any point on that line, the tangent is parallel to the velocity vector. So to the velocity of the fluid at that point. So the velocity is always tangent. Uh, which is great because if the velocity is always tangent to the streamline, that means there can be no velocity perpendicular to a streamline. Yeah, then um, we can start looking at mass conservation. So I can, from a mass conservation point of view, we were talking about continuity, so that's directly related. 
um, these streamlines can be seen as solid boundaries in a mass conservation sense that they do not allow flow to come in or air to come in or to leave uh, from the bounds. So what the air that comes in from this side, the mass flow rate of air that comes in from uh, this side, which is perpendicular to the streamline, has to leave at the, at the other end. So uh, from mass conservation, if that mass flow rate has to be equal to that mass flow rate, and the mass flow rate is just an area times density times a velocity, so you'll see um, this distance or this area is larger than this area. So the area, the distance between the streamlines tell us this, whether the flow is speeding or, uh, or slowing down. So because the, that's a longer streamline. So the flow here is faster than the flow here because here you have a smaller area than you have here because the mass flow rate is just the density. We're dealing with constant density times a velocity times an area. Uh, and the velocity and the area are perpendicular to each other. Uh, so we said the mass flow rate that comes here is the same as the mass flow rate that leaves. And um, the areas are different, so the velocities have to also be different. And how different? So as the air, the larger area uh, means smaller velocity. So that is, uh, that's one important use of the streamlines. You can look at the picture and you'd say, okay, my flow here is slower than it is here and it's slower than it is, or faster than it is there. Um, and if the streamline, so by definition, the streamline is tangent to the velocity vector. So if you have two tangent vectors and crosses, um, do a cross product between them, you should get zero. So I have my velocity vector and I have my S vector that's parallel to the streamline or tangent to the streamline at a certain point. And I cross product those two, I should get, um, I should get zero. But now let's say I'm, I'm dealing with a two dimensional uh, system. So I don't have, uh, I only have a two dimensional flow. So U is the velocity uh, in the x direction, v is in the j or y direction, and w is in the k or z direction. And the streamline is also two-dimensional, so I don't have the k. So I have two. I have an. I have the streamline to be in the x y plane, as you can see here. That's a streamline in the x y uh, plane. I don't have a z or k plane. So when I cross product those two. Uh, the velocity with the S direction, uh, I'm going to get to this um, this quantity, which is equal to zero by definition. So V dx minus U dy is equal to zero. Why are those zero? Because I it's a two dimensional system. I there is no there is no k. So I times k that's zero, and that's actually uh, J times k is zero. So I only end up with I times J. When you multiply i with j, you're going to get a k, which is what you get over here. Um, so we just look at the argument of it. So v dx minus u dy is zero. So uh, it it tells us that the tangent of the velocity vector, um, or the direction of the velocity vector, is tangent to the line uh, dy dx. So that's what it is. And here, here's an example. Um, so if I give you u and v, you have that formula, you can get me the line. So if I, I give you the formula for v as a function of x and y, v as a function of x and y, you end up with dy dx, you integrate and then you get, you get the line. Um, you get the shape of the line, the shape of this line, the streamline. Uh, but now let's say, uh, I want to do the opposite, and this is what the exam this example is about. Let's say my streamline um, has this relationship, y equals cx. So c is a constant. So the relationship between y and x is a straight line. So these are all straight lines, and there are different c's. So c is the slope. So here's uh, c is this slope 
of this line this has this line has a higher slope this line has a negative slope um, right so um, let's see and now we want to do the opposite is to find the u and v uh, from from the streamline so one is you can just um, uh, you um, you have the the uh, the u over v you get the ratio v over u which is dy dx because you have you have the streamline but now you can start proposing things so you'll say uh, we can guess what what the velocity field is going to be so if my y is cx is the shape of my streamline then uh, my dy dx that's the 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 dy dx is equal to you differentiate this you get a c uh, but dy dx is also v over u. So now v over u, the ratio between v and u is c. Then let's say I can propose u to be equal ax and uh, v to be bx. Do they satisfy this thing? Uh, sure. You divide v over u, you're going to get b over a, which is c. Um, so that's that's fine. But then does this satisfy continuity because streamlines as we said are mass conservative so they satisfy continuity when we talked about this example of uh, mass flow rate coming in and out the distance between the streamline tell us telling us something about the velocity so they're mass conservative so do they does the proposed solution of u equal, equal ax and v equal bx um, satisfy continuity Let's see, does it, so continuity is du dx plus dv dy is zero. So du dx, so what is du dx? Um, so here's my u, du dx is a, and plus dv dy, uh, so v is bx, dv dy is going to give me zero because it doesn't depend on y. So when you sum a plus zero, that's not going to give me zero. So it's not mass conservative. So my proposition, my initial guess doesn't make sense. So somehow I have to change my V um, to uh, give me uh, so that when I do the dv dy, I'm going to uh, end up summing to zero. So I'll keep u equal ax. And then let me set V to, e to be equal to by. So I'm going to get du dx plus dv dy uh, will be equal to zero if my a is equal to minus b so then when a equal to minus b then that would be a solution it's it satisfies the continuity equation um, and it's a solution to the streamline equation so that would be a a velocity that's a solution to my um to my um streamline equation so if I change the C, I'm going to get a different, uh, so now going back to this equation, a different slope C gives me a different streamline. So it's a, this is a family, so with different C that you get a family of, of streamlines. Okay, um, so I think next time we will start we will talk about uh stream function um, uh, stream functions uh, which is when we have a family of streamlines we group them into uh, a stream function so uh, that's where we are going to take it um, from next time thank you for your attention and talk to you later